to us soon in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Well, it's good to see you all sitting back in your normal seats. I'll say that much. What's up with that? I'm just kidding. If you, if you weren't here last week, um, Tiffany and Marilyn had everybody sitting in different seats. And I was like, hey, wait, I remember this. This has happened before. This is a Tiffany and Marilyn thing, right? So just to give you a little insight, what was cooking in my brain was I knew they were pulling an April Fool's joke on me. But I'm like, I'm going to pull one on them and not say anything. So I just want to say that publicly. Let's give Tiffany and Marilyn a big hand for being good sports. You know, it, it, I, I commend you, too, for playing along. It's a big deal to sit in a different seat in church on Sunday. I mean, come on, man. I don't even know if you even remember anything I said being in a different seat, like a totally different perspective. you got to look at the back of a different head. It's totally weird, I'm sure. Um, but it's, like I said, it's good that we're back together and sitting where we, we need to sit. So um, we're in the Gospel of Mark, and um, we've been going through this journey of Lent. And Lent, if you haven't been with us, Lent is a season that simply means lengthen, that as the days get longer... Um, the church for many, many years has taken the time to think about, to look at their hearts, to pray, to fast, to even give stuff away in preparation for the excitement of Easter Sunday. And I've heard it said many, many times, and I think you'll agree with me, that unless you come to grips with Good Friday, you won't really understand the wonder of Easter Sunday. Good Friday is about death, right? Good Friday is about what Jesus did and dying for us on the cross for our sins. And thank God that some stuff died in us when Jesus died on the cross. Our sin nature. Um, Pastor Scott mentioned that we were in Romans 8. And man, uh, in our men's group on, on the, in the morning on Fridays, we were reading Romans 8. And it's just like... If you read Romans chapter 7, you're just like, what a wretched man I am. I can't do anything right. Everything I hate, I end up doing. You, 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 you know, I think we all can identify with that. And then you get this, thanks be to God, right? For the gift of God in Jesus Christ. And then you get into Romans chapter 8. You realize there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. We realize that, that we're more than conquerors, even in the midst of all this stuff. Praise God. But we also realize that now we have this new normal, right? That our, our old life was about a sin nature that was super selfish, right? How many of you know that a sin nature is super, super, super selfish? It's just about what you want, how you want, when you want. Can't get what you need fast enough. Can't get enough of what you like. It's just is that way. But what Jesus came to do is to crucify that old nature on the cross, having never sinned a moment in his life, the perfect son of God. And then it says that, that through his death that we can have life. And so it's more than just the quick ticket to ask Jesus in our heart and then get to go to heaven. It is that, right? And thank God for a better life. Thank God for eternity. But what, what Easter Sunday, what Good Friday is all about is a new nature. It's about a new way of living, living in the Spirit. And for those of us that are, have been trying to walk this road, um, whether you've been doing it for years or months or weeks, you know that the grace of God carries you through stuff, right? We know that, that we're able to do things that we wouldn't be able to do on our own. Uh, we need the help of the Holy Spirit to do anything. Um, but we're thankful that with, with that with the help of the Holy Spirit that we're becoming more and more like Jesus. And so today I want to talk a little bit about that, about Jesus as our master, right? That Jesus, and I say that word master in terms of a, of a relationship between a master and an apprentice. There are some of you in here that are, are um, skilled laborers and some of you have gone through an apprenticeship program. There are others of you that in business maybe you've been mentored before. Um, you've had somebody who'd shown you the way. Uh, sometimes you hear those stories about people people who had a, a mentor or a, a master craftsman that's teaching you the trade. And um, I, I love being around people who know how to do stuff, you know, and I, I'm so interested in, in how the skills have come and whether it's a mechanics or electrical or carpentry or whatever it is. But I find it so funny and, and awesome at the same time when, they, when those who have been mentored by someone tell stories about the one that mentored them, right? It's, it, they're the best stories ever. Uh, I'll give you an example. A while back, I, I met a, a new friend who had helped me work on my Volkswagen, and he, he was helping me with the, the, the motor. And this guy was like the real deal. He was German, which is always good when you're working on a German vehicle. He was a, 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 in another life, he was trained as a German Volkswagen mechanic by another German. 
And man, every story, every, every screw he turned, every bolt that he cranked, everything that he did, he yelled at me a little bit too, you know. And, and, but he would tell me the stories about the guy who trained him. He said, oh, and he would always say the German. Ah, oh, the German used to make me do this. Ah, oh, the German used to say that. And this was, this was like 20 plus years ago in his life. But just every time he did something, everything he touched on that motor, he had a story about his master in that, in that particular field. And it's, it's just so interesting to me. And there, there's so many others. It's like this, this, this uh, relationship that people have with this person that they deeply respect, but that was so terrible to them at the same time. And they can't forget the things that were taught to them. Well, when we begin to look at Jesus as the master who's apprenticing us, we see that we have one that we should have stories about all the time. That the things that we do, it's like when we're talking to people, it's, it becomes very normal for us to go, yeah, my mentor showed me this. And you see, the good thing about Jesus is you're not going to have all those stories about your mentor being mean to you because he loves you with an everlasting love. And so this morning, I want to look a little bit at the disciples. Um, I find a lot of comfort in reading about people like Peter, James, and John. You know, the, the, this, these three amigos. Man, they, they do some stuff that's extraordinary and they do some stuff that's extraordinarily ridiculous. And so for, for us as humans, it's so great to look at them and go, okay, I'm going to be all right. <laughs> you follow me? Everybody take your pulse real quick. Just not sure. I don't know if we need some emergency. We got a retired doctor in the house just in case we need you. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so you're with me. All right. So, so in the Gospel of Mark, there's a theme in Mark. And if you talk to anybody who is a um, you know, Bible scholar, they'll always tell you that Mark is a fast-moving gospel. Right? It gets right into it. And there's actually a Greek word called uh, euthis. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. I could try to add some syllables to it to make me sound smarter. But there's a Greek word that is translated immediately or straight away, right? Everybody say immediately, immediately. or straight away. It's, it's in, like an, in, the, in the New Testament a handful of times, but in the Gospel of Mark, it's in there 41 times, maybe 42, depending on this, the, the manuscript that you're looking at. In the very first chapter of Mark, it's in there 11 times, immediately, 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 straight away. We can only assume, and, and that's the best we can do, is what, why Mark did that, what his motives were about putting that word in there so many times. But there's this idea of something, if you're going to repeat a word 41 or 42 times, there's some intentionality about it, wouldn't you agree? I'll give you some examples. Um, in, in 110, immediately he's coming out of the water and he, see heaven, he, see heavens op he sees the heavens open and the spirit descending like a dove. Two verses later, immediately the Spirit calls him to go out into the desert, um, into the wilderness. The next, in, in 18, immediately when he calls the disciples, they leave their nets and they follow him. Immediately um, he calls them and, um, and then the next set of disciples leave and follow him as well. Immediately they go into the, the synagogue at Capernaum. Immediately they go into Peter's mother-in-law's house and she gets immediately healed. Do you, get the, do you get the theme? It can almost be annoying if I keep saying immediately. The idea is some intent, some, something purposeful is happening. Some scholars would say that, that um, the word straight away is like a play on words to show that Jesus was on the level. I don't know. I don't know where they get this stuff. Or maybe. But I thought to myself, I want to bring this immediately up to you so that we can immediately get in to the next passage. All right? So here we go. Apprenticeship with Jesus. Jesus was always teaching. Have you noticed that? As you read his life, everything with Jesus was a teachable moment. That means that if you're walking with him and you're going through something, if you're going through a high, high, it's like, whoa, that was awesome. There's a teachable moment for you. If you're going through something of difficulty and, and, um, and trial and test, there's something of a teachable moment for you. If it was true for the disciples, it's true for you. I think it's been said many times from this pulpit and probably worth repeating week after week that, that Jesus doesn't waste an ounce of our pain. He doesn't delight or joy in it. He doesn't go, wow, cool, you know, they're going through a difficult time or look at that loss or trial. I believe the heart of God grieves over pain and suffering. I believe the heart of God grieves over senseless loss of life, over disease, over cancer, over all this stuff that happens in our world. I believe the heart of God is grieved over it because it was never meant to be that way. And so the thought that somehow God is, is, you know, bringing this on is just really foreign to my concept of who our God is. God created us to be in relationship with him in this perfect, beautiful garden. And somehow we know in the, in the story that we chose 
selfishness and the sin nature which led us into a, a bunch of heartache and Jesus comes as the rescuer. Jesus comes in and breaks into our history with redeeming power and the, the fact that he can take a garbage situation and make something beautiful out of it is really awesome. And so we see that happening all throughout scripture. Um, Jesus seems to not only call, and there, there does as you read through the Gospel of Mark, and I hope you get the chance to do it or take the opportunity to do it, but you, you can follow along and see that there's a cast of people, and some are like spectators on the fringes that want to get a little, you know, benefit from being around the Messiah. They're, they're often in the big crowds pressing in on Jesus, and, and, and I don't blame them, and you and I would probably be the same, man. If, if we were hopeless and helpless in our diseases or whatever was going on in our life, we'd probably be pressing in, elbowing people, kicking people, breaking roofs down, whatever we need to do to get near Jesus so that he could touch us, amen? So we can't be too hard on these folks, but we can say about them that they were not necessarily the disciples. They were on the outside, on the peripheral. They were, they were the crowd. And the crowd were like spectators, but there was another layer of people closer to Jesus, and they were called disciples, right? And, and they had two different um, relationships with God. One seemed to be the takers, and the disciples at some point were that, don't get me wrong, we're going to see it right in Scripture. But Jesus took time with the disciples to teach and mentor them, and they were the apprentices to the Messiah. Um, I was reading in a leadership journal about this principle of... of um, of mentoring or, or apprenticeship and seeing how some cultures, I mentioned Germany before, Switzerland, a lot of Europe has this. The, I think Germany has like 342 or 400 and some crazy amount of different trades that any young person can get involved with and be in a program that there's somebody who leads them through how to do it and sets them working in, in, in their life and um, many other nations have it and probably less here in our nation and this isn't a, I don't even know why I said any of that because it doesn't mean anything to anything but it gets to this point that as reading in that journal, you saw this principle of what um, apprenticeship looks like. And I'm going to put this slide up and it, it shows this progression of, of how people are apprenticed. The first part says, um, I do, you watch, we talk. Right? Okay? I do. So, so the, the master, Jesus, let's say in this time, would, would do it. I do it. You watch. The disciples watch. And then we talk. And you follow that progression. It's really fascinating that Jesus would show them something and then they would, he would tell a parable and everybody would be tripping out and then Jesus would sit and talk to them about it, right? It was an intentional training time. The next thing, I do, you help, we talk, right? It's the, the next part. And you, you get this, um, the picture of this in Mark chapter 6. Do you remember when, when Jesus was... Um, with the, these crazy crowds and, and everybody was in a remote location and they were hungry. It's the feeding of the 5,000. Um, raise your hand if you've heard 5,000 sermons on the feeding of the 5,000. Okay, good. Here's 5,000 and one a little for you. Five, five, <laughs> the feeding of the 5,000. They come to Jesus fretting, going, what are we going to do? These people are here. We've got to feed them. And what does Jesus say? Do you remember? Don't even look in your Bible if you've heard 5,000 sermons. What does he say? You feed them, right? You give them something to eat. So, um, so I do, you help, we talk. Um, and they're like, well, what, what do we do? And Jesus leads them through a process where they can figure out how they can help in the process. And what it was, was he said, go find out what do you have, right? What do you have? And they said, well, we don't know. And he says, go find out. So as we sort of take pause there and maybe connect um, some of the dots in our own life for a minute, that probably, if we're being honest, that most of us, um, we hang out in our Christian faith right around these first two things, right? And there's going to be more I'll show you in just a moment. But, but when, when he... Um, and when we look at any kind of situation or when we, we're, we're trying to grow in our faith, we often think lowly of ourselves. We often think like, well, I don't know what I have. And the answer that Jesus has to us is go and find out, right? Go and find out and start with what you have. Every single one of us have something to give, right? We all have something uh, around us, some resource. And it's amazing what happens within this principle when we follow out that story in the the sermon isn't about the feeding of the 5,000 nor the four, but, but in that sermon, or excuse me, in that story, they come to him with what they have, and what does Jesus do? He offers it up to the Lord, right? He blesses it, and then it multiplies, and then the disciples take the baskets, and they pass it out. He does, they help, and then they talk, right? 
Same thing happens a few chapters later as you're reading through Mark. Then there's the feeding of the 4,000. The same scenario. You guys should read it. It's, a, it's, it's great because this time there's less dialogue about it. It's the same head scratching. How are we going to feed these guys? Repetition. Go see what you have. Figure it out. Bring it before the Lord. Allow God to bless it. Be part of distributing it. And watch what happens. Isn't it a, a crazy, crazy miracle and mystery that as you give what you have as unto the Lord, there's always enough and then some left over? I mean, I want you to think about your best days and think about the reason why if there's an opportunity for a mission trip or to go help somewhere in serving, if you've done that before, it's almost like this kind of like... I don't know, this drive that you want to do more of that. You don't sit and think like, man, I want to go and build something at my house right now. Or I want to go clean stuff up or do whatever. But when given the opportunity to go and serve somebody else, isn't it mysterious how you give what you have, maybe some trash bags, your hands, and picking up stuff, and it has such far-reaching implications. It blesses beyond. And then you're like, wait, there's all this left over now. Now I have more energy. I wish it felt like that when I cleaned my garage. It does not feel like that. <laughs> but this is part of the mystery of seeing what happens when, um, when we follow our, our, our master. The second, or excuse me, the third thing is, I do, do we have a third thing? That's okay. <laughs> I do, excuse me, you do, I help, we talk, right? So you do, I help, we talk. You see this where Jesus sends out two by two. How must that have felt, right? That two by two, he sends his disciples out and they go into the villages and they, and the Bible says that they preached the gospel, they anointed the sick with oil, they cast out demons. That must have been amazing. We know it was because they came back so excited telling Jesus, man, they all, these demons submitted to the authority that we have. Jesus brings them back down to earth and say, okay, this is all good that that happened, but rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Don't find identity in all this. You're my servants. But it's a picture of how he followed the, the pattern, right? The fourth thing is, you do, I watch, we talk. I look at that as when Jesus now ascends back to heaven and you have this early church experience where Acts chapter 2, the Spirit falls on the church. Um, uh, these normal everyday people do things way better than any human should be able to do it. Peter should not be able to preach so good that 3,000 people come to faith. Come on, man. We know Peter, right? Um, you shouldn't be able to heal the sick like that. The, the church shouldn't grow with such an um, exponential growth. In fact, I, I love this. It's worth reading if you want to look in your Bibles in Acts chapter 2, 42. I'm sorry, not there yet. Excuse me, Mark chapter 16, 15. You do, I watch, we talk. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. And whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. What Jesus left within that great commission, which you've often heard said, it's not the great suggestion, you know, or sometimes we're guilty of the great omission. But it's this commission that he gives us to go and preach. And he hands it over. He says, now you do. And I'm with you. I'm with you always. I'm watching. And, we'll, and prayer is the constant theme that's connected through each time we'll pray. And we'll talk about it. Um, the fifth thing, if you can go back to the other slide, Justin. You do, this is my favorite one. You do, someone else watches, dot, dot, dot. Are you following the progression there? I do, you watch, we talk. I do, you help, we talk. You do, I help, we talk. You do, I watch, we talk. And the fifth one is so important, and I think so many times we miss this one. John calls us in, in his gospel that, that we're to be abiding in the vine, right? And that we're to bear good fruit and fruit that would remain. And the part of that is where I, I jumped ahead, but in the Acts chapter 2, 42, where you begin to see the church clicking and functioning together, where now what these apostles were doing, those that were filled and mentored by the, the power of Jesus, they began looking like Jesus, acting like him, talking like him, and guess what? Other people began to follow them as they followed Jesus. And it goes on and on and on. Amen. I think we get stuck between one and two because we don't know where to go. We don't know where to go. But look at Acts. Now, now you can for real. Look at Acts chapter 2, 40, um, 42. 
such a beautiful picture of what healthy church looks like. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. What was the apostles' teaching? Remember the, the helper, the Holy Spirit given by Jesus. I'm going to help you remember everything I taught you. And then that gets multiplied on. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. Verse 45, selling their possessions and good and they gave it to anyone who had a need. Everyone, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Beautiful. Beautiful. We know that the church didn't stay there. Like if you read your Bible and you understand through Acts, through persecution and difficulty, people began to get scattered. But as it's said um, by people much wiser than I, you can kill the messenger, but you can't kill the message. No, no matter how hard they tried to shut down the reality of the gospel, it spread like wildfire. And guys, you are part of that. This is not just some old time religion, some old history book, that this is what we're a part of. And Lent reminds us of this. Easter reminds us of this. Good Friday reminds us of, of this. It injects something into us, hopefully. Um, I, I like this author, and, and I think a lot of people have read his stuff. We've, we've done it in youth group and even in our Sunday school. But Bob Goff, have you ever read Bob Goff stuff? Love Does or Everyone Always. If you haven't, you should jot it down. And he's just a, a, a fun, easy read, but, but really challenging in the way that we look at our, our Christian faith. And he says something really compelling, right? If, this guy, you read his stuff and go, my goodness, how do you do all this stuff? But he just cuts past all the baloney and just gets down to loving people, you know? And, and, and it's amazing what God's done through his life. And I won't give him too much away of his book. But what he says in there that's really fascinating to me is he says that Jesus isn't looking for us to agree with him, okay? I want you to think about this for a second. That we, as uh, those in, in step one and two, as we're watching him do it and getting a little, dabbling in our faith a little bit, and, and we're watching it happen. He isn't calling us to just agree with him. Like, yes, I agree with everything Jesus said. He isn't necessarily even calling us to just support him. I support Jesus when I vote for Jesus for president. I'm supportive of him. It wasn't his point. Bob Goff says that Jesus wasn't looking for people to agree with him. He was looking for people to live like him. Yes. That was a big like, whoa. <laughs> Jesus wasn't looking for people to agree with him, but for people to live like him. And his whole point is living like Jesus is not um, a, a life of, of sorrow. I mean, it is in, many, in some ways for sure. But he's saying this is a great adventure. And he calls it becoming love, right? Becoming love. How many of you want to become more judgmental in your life? Man, you're just aching to be a bigger jerk, right? I, mean, I just want to be a bigger jerk. I want to get old and grouchy. He's saying as you become more like love, you become way less judgmental. You begin to see what people are intended to be in Christ. You have eyes to see past your own stuff and you'll be able to see who God is, is calling to be. And you can start, all you got to do is just start treating them like that. Start calling that stuff out. That's fun. Does that mean you don't talk about sin anymore? No. Does that mean that you don't challenge people and they need to be challenged? Absolutely not. You need to do that. The Bible's clear about that. But when you do that through the lenses of judgment and just grouchiness and jerkiness or whatever, it just doesn't work. Because you agree with everything Jesus said, so you're going to let somebody have it. But when you're becoming like Jesus, you're becoming love, and you're able to do the same things he did, and people are like, yes, okay, what must I do to be saved? As a follower... Um, as, as followers, I already said this, we can get stuck somewhere in the process, but as servant leaders, um, we're, we're going through this with Jesus. We're not only going through an apprenticeship, but we are becoming masters ourselves and apprenticing others. I think um, there's a lot to be said of that. The real um, core of what I wanted to share with you today is that for sure, but, um, but also comes as we, we carry on um, into chapter 10, right? And so if you want to turn in your Bibles to chapter 10, I'm going to read through a series of verses and just give you some observations of some really interesting stuff. Um, these disciples who are, again, being uh, apprenticed by Jesus, 
They're making some great headway and then they'll blow it big time. Jesus is a clear communicator all the way. He's a man on a mission, right? His mission is to come and to serve, to seek and save the lost, to, to come to the, to all the way to Calvary's cross. And he's not, he's not secretive about it. In, in Mark chapter 8, he tells him, hey guys, this is what's going to happen. It says that in Mark chapter 8, he speaks really plainly to Peter. Peter, I'm going to die. And this is what my mission is. And, and, and what does Peter do? He rebukes Jesus, right? He, he pulls him aside and goes, no, uh, I mean, well, I don't even know what that looks like, but rebukes the Son of God, and then Jesus like super rebukes Peter. He's like, you think that's a rebuke? How about this one? Get behind me, Satan. Because Peter, um, in, in his own humanity, in his own frailty, he like, and we've been through this many times, he gets the answer right about, Pastor Andy did a great job teaching us about that, but he checks the box that yes, you're the Son of God, and then moments later when he hears the mission of the Son of God is to, to be beaten and die for the sins of all mankind, he goes, wait, no, and rebukes him. And the very enemy motivates Peter's talk, and, and Jesus, re I call it the super rebuke, anything from Jesus is super. Um, Mark chapter 9, something amazing happens in Mark chapter 9. The transfiguration. If you read that story, it's fascinating as well. Jesus takes three guys, Peter, James, and John. Everybody say, Peter, James, and John. Yes. He takes them away, and it's like, they must have been feeling like, yeah, we're the in crowd. The rest of the knuckleheads are, you know, counting fish or doing something else somewhere else, but we're close with Jesus. He goes, and, and then Jesus shows his glory, basically. He transfigures before them, and I wonder what that was like. Brilliant light, you know, a gown that was whiter than white can be, and, and they see very clearly this rabbi, this master, he is, he, this is, this is glorious. And, and if you're around something really glorious, and you're in this moment, um, they were in this moment, and nobody knew what to do. And I love it because you get insight into Peter's personality. He's like, hey, what if we built shelters for Moses and Elijah? Wouldn't that be sweet? And it says in parentheses, Peter said this because he didn't know what to say, right? Just sort of inserted, filling in the gap in this moment where they're, they're with Jesus. But the point, is, point being is that they saw Jesus in all his glory. And then right after that, Jesus says, okay, now you see me in all my glory? I'm going to die. I'm going to be persecuted, and this is part of my mission. The next time that he says this is in Mark 10, and that's where we are for our text this morning. So this is the third time now that Jesus has told his followers that he um, was going to die. In Mark chapter 10, verse 32, it says, They were on their way to Jerusalem, with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished, and those who followed were afraid. Man, I spent like a lot of time just going over that, and I, I, I had this whole other sermon about um, the difference between being astonished and afraid. Isn't that interesting, that first line right there, where I don't know what version you're reading out of. If you're reading out of the New King James, it might read a little bit different, but it says they were on their way to Jerusalem, and Jesus was leading the way. Think for a moment what's going on in Jesus' mind. Going to Jerusalem wasn't for like souvenirs, you know. He, he wasn't heading in to see the Holy Land. He was on his way to his death. And as he was heading into his death, he was leading the charge. And those that were close to them were, were astonished. They were in awe of all this. But those who were in the crowd, um, those were those, those spectators, they were following along the way and they were afraid. Um, in verse in verse, uh, blah, blah. And those who, were, who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and he told them what was going to happen. Verse 33. We're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And in three days later, he will rise. For these ones that were close, okay, ones that, that knew what was going to happen, saw him in all his glory, this was the most detail they've gotten up until this point. Now they're, they're hearing specific detail about the Gentiles, about the flogging and so forth. And, and I don't know about you, but you put yourself in, in, in their setting and you hear that. And the very next thing that Mark records is just astounding to me. And I think as I read it, it might be astounding to you. Then James and John, remember part of the end crew, you know, the three that got to see him in all his glory. The sons of Zebedee came to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Okay, mind you, 
uh, let me just do a rewind because I'm not sure um, if you're awake. It says, um, he had just got done telling them these details. The chief priests and the teachers of the law, they'll condemn me to death and hand me over to the Gentiles who will mock and spit and flog and kill. And then three days later, I'll rise. I think that might have been one of those moments to go, wow. Not to go, hey Jesus, you want to be like a genie for me? I'm about to rub the, you know, the genie bottle and just like whatever I ask, okay, God promise. He just felt, feels like little kids, right? God promise that whatever I ask, you're going to say yes to. And you know what you get from Jesus here? And I can't, I, I don't know the tone, but I don't read anger into the tone. You know, I, I just am so appreciative of the way that Jesus is with us. They said, we want you to do whatever we ask. And I love this. Verse 36. What do you want me to do for you? I don't think I would have said that. I think what I would have said was, really? <laughs> yeah, what, what do you want me to do for you? They replied. And it gets even better, you guys. It gets even better. I mean, it could have been at that point like, okay, Jesus, will you let us at least be with you when you're going through all this stuff? Will you let us walk side by side with you? And, you know, will you let us take some of the weight of what you're going to have to go through? Can we take someone out for you? Is there anyone we can, you know, can we get in there? And... No, it was kind of opportunistic if you ask me. They replied, how about you let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in glory? Really? There's a, another gospel writer that says their mom was involved and she was the one that was like asking it. That's even worse. <laughs> Jesus says this so kindly. You, boys, you don't know what you're asking. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. And, and again, I could be wrong. I don't read exclamation points. I don't read anger. I... I I read servant. I read compassion. You don't know what you're asking. Jesus said, can you drink of the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm being baptized with? The cup that he was about to drink. You remember what he said um, when he's in the garden and he's sweating drops of blood? God, if this cup could just pass. What he was about to drink was an unjust death with the weight of the sin of all the world on his shoulders. I don't think, boys, you can drink of that cup. But they, uh, they continue on and they say, I, and I imagine them just being real chipper when they say it too, extra chipper. Like, we can, right? We can. And then Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. But to sit at the right or left for me... Um, Left for me is not to grant. These places are for those whom have been, whom have been prepared. Um, in my notes, I just put awkward in all caps right there. And, and the reason that I know it was an awkward moment and that I'm not reading too much into the interpretation of the text is how everybody else who was there felt at that moment. Um, you're probably pretty aware of being in social settings when people say stuff they're not supposed to say. And do things they're not supposed to do. And oftentimes we don't like tell them straight up. But we sure tell them with body language. Or we tell somebody else that when they're talking stupid. Or doing something that shouldn't be done. And you're looking at someone like, like doing the whatever face. or what. It was like that. In verse 41. When the ten heard about this. They became indignant with James and John. You think? <laughs> They're pretty ticked off. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us why they were mad. They could have been mad like, man, I wish I would have got in there first and asked Jesus for the genie thing, you know? They, they, they could have been mad because they're like, how inappropriate that you're asking the master that. We don't know. But we know that human nature in that moment is they were mad. And there you begin to feel the tension and the division that's happening with the disciples. And when there was tension and division and Jesus was reading body language, just like all of you can read weird in the room, he was reading it. And Jesus says the master goes for a teachable moment. And I love this. I think you or I, I can speak for myself, probably would have gone in for the big rebuke. He goes in for this. Jesus called them together, right? And he says, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them. 
and, and their high officials exercise authority over them. They were, that's what James and John were asking for. Hey, right and left, man, wherever you're going, we want to be up there with you. And then Jesus says in 43, you want to be an apprentice of me, the master. It's not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be a servant. And then 44 says, and whoever wants to be first must be a slave to all. In verse 45, it says, the son of man, this is the key to the whole book. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I put in my notes here, live like the Master, don't just agree with him. Amen. I could sit and go, yeah, I agree with that. That's why I follow Jesus, because he's a servant. But in my own life, when I was looking for application, I'm saying, man, I got to live like that. I've got to live like that on Monday morning. I've got to live like that on Sunday afternoon. Serving people in conversation. Serving people. Seeing beyond the awkward moment. Seeing beyond the silly question. Seeing beyond what I perceive the motive is. And seeing what Jesus would be like in that situation. Walking in servanthood. Because it isn't about me. It isn't about you. It's about us as servants. Am I, am I making any sense? Yes. But then it gets even better. It gets even better. The next passage of scripture, and then they got to go on a walk. Because see, they're, they're walking, you know, and, and they're together. In verse 46, it says, Then they came to Jericho. And as Jesus and his disciples, they were together with a large crowd. They were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus. Whenever the Bible gives you specifics like that, it's for a reason. The original reader, it wouldn't have been like, Oh yeah, and there was one more blind man that Jesus healed. This was Bartimaeus. This was a guy that everybody knew. In fact, Scripture tells us enough about him to know which Bartimaeus it was. It was Timaeus' son. I would imagine he was like a fixture in the town. He was somebody that stood by in the street and begged all the time that people would walk past him several times in the day. And this time, they, he sees Jesus coming. And he's sitting there and he's begging along the roadside. In verse 47, it says, When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out, he didn't say it timid or quiet. He shouts out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And, and, and again, in the awkwardness of the crowd, they're like, that's so inappropriate. People start like rebuking him and saying, many rebuke and told him, be quiet, beggar, blind guy. Be quiet, they shouted. The son, and, 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 they, and then he shouts all the more. You can't shut me up. Son of David, have mercy on me. They rebuke him, but Jesus stopped and said, call him. And so they called him and they said, cheer up, old boy. It's your big day, man. Cheer up. Get on your feet. He's calling you. And throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and he came to Jesus. In verse 51, he says, what do you want me to do for you? That's Jesus. Hey, do you remember any other time when Jesus said that? It was like five minutes ago. Five minutes ago, Jesus says to James and John, what do you want me to do for you? Now to blind Bartimaeus, Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? It's an intentional link between one story and the other, and so you've got to look at them together. And so now as we're looking at them together, and we say, what do you want me to do for you? And Jesus asked him, um, Jesus, and the blind man said to the rabbi, I want to see. I want to see. Go, Jesus said, your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his, his sight and he followed Jesus along the road. Praise God. I mean, we, could, we could make a whole message out of the faith that he had and the faith that you need and the faith that I need to, to be able to get a miracle. And we do. And he was healed. But there's so much more going on because you got two brothers who were like with Jesus, the master, all the time. They heard plainly what was going on. They heard three times what was going to happen to him. They saw him in all his glory. But they were blind. Do you follow me? You have a literal blind man who's on the side of the road and he can see. And the result of, of the miracle of being able to see for blind Bartimaeus wasn't like, woohoo, I can see. 
The result was, now I know where to go. And where he followed Jesus was on the road to Jerusalem. Do you know where blind Bartimaeus was following Jesus? He was following him on the road to Calvary. Man, Good Friday. Good Friday is the road to Calvary. It's the road for us maybe to ask God, God, help, help me see. Help me see because I can't see on my own. I've been in church my whole life and I'm looking like this. I can't see. I hear things about you and I, I, I want to grow in you, but I can't see. Maybe, just maybe, some of you are like me and go, I can kind of, if I'm honest, relate to James and John. Maybe a little more than I'm relating to blind Bartimaeus right now. And in that, I, I just want to bring us to a, a place of application. Not a place of condemnation, not a place of guilt, but man, oh man, a place of freedom. Because Good Friday is really good because stuff gets to die on the cross. Stuff that needs to die. But unless we identify what some of that stuff is, we'll just move right past it on into Easter and on into the next year. And what a great opportunity for us to come before the Lord and say, God, have mercy on me and help me to see. And I wrote down some things here that, that made sense to me. The first thing in terms of application is um, you may need to see some things in your life that are inappropriate, awkward, sinful. The disciples were annoyed at James and John, but Jesus taught without shaming them for the condition of their heart. You see, there, there, there may be people around your life that, that see some things in you and they're on you about it or whatever else. Jesus isn't that way. But unless you ask him to see with the real eyes the stuff that needs to change, I, I wrote it down this way, I'm going to say it again. Things that are inappropriate, things that are awkward, and things that are sinful. He wants to come to you in his kindness and go, yeah, that's not how we do things. And help you out of that stuff so that some of that can die on the cross. The second thing that, that you may need to open your eyes to opportunities um, and go beyond just agreeing with him and step into doing with him. Becoming love, as Bob Goff says. Let me say that again. That we may need to ask Jesus, open my eyes, that I can go beyond agreeing with you. Man, I'm super excited about Jesus. I agree with him. To go beyond that into looking at what you have. What do I have? What, what do I have here? What do I have that I might offer it up to God, see it multiplied, so that I have enough to give and then some more? And the final thing I think is really important too. You may need to ask Jesus to open your eyes into areas where you're missing the opportunity to give stuff away. To give things away. And I'm not talking about your money. We're not calling the ushers for an offering right now. You're welcome to give more of your money if you'd like. But what I'm talking about is this. There's some of us have status. Some of us have um, a ministry. Some of us have stuff. And there are people that are all around you going, man, I'd sure like to get in the game a little bit. And sometimes if our eyes are closed, all we see them as is helpers, right? These are just helpers for me to do what I'm meant to do. Well, I think Jesus might be calling some of us into simple things, not just to have helpers, but to have those that, that can follow that one through five process with you. And the dream is this, that it's you're now stepping away and going, okay, you do, I'll watch, and we'll talk, you know? It doesn't happen unless you're intentional about it. The church doesn't thrive, and I mean the church as a whole doesn't thrive unless we're giving stuff away. And, and guess what? The more that you give away, guess what's in your hands? More room for more stuff. For the next level, for the next phase, for what God has for you. The more that you hold on like this, you got no room in there. Such a great story about the difference between plastic pearls and real, real pearls. And so many of us um, hang on to plastic pearls. We hang on to stuff that isn't real because it's so comfortable. It looks so real. It's what we've had. And we just let it go and the real pearls that he wants to put back in our hands. And so my prayer for you today is this. That you would be a lot like blind Bartimaeus. That you would just say, God have mercy on me so that I can see. Would you stand with me? And I'm right with you this morning. Lord, we, we come to you humble. We come to you extremely grateful. Lord, we come to you expectant. That you would give us insight into things that we can't see on our own. I'm certain James and John could not see how inappropriate or awkward their request was. They needed, they needed you to gently walk them through the process. And to teach them in that moment that it wasn't about status, it was about servanthood. I'm certain that in my life and my friends that, that there's stuff that we can't see. We need your help.
to show us the awkward, to show us the inappropriate, to show us the sinful, so that we can see it, God, and, and let it die with you on the cross and let resurrection power come. That we can be like those multipliers of the early church that, that not only held on to status or whatever, but gave stuff away and helped people do like you did. The multiplication of, of the kingdom. So God, I, I say yes to it. Lord, we together just welcome you, Holy Spirit, to show us new things this week, new things today. And all through the power of your spirit, God. And I thank you for your joy. Lord, I pray that as we end this service now, that we would end it with open hearts to hear your voice, but that we would also go out with joy and be led forth with peace. I thank you for it in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. 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 God bless you.